Hello and welcome to Talking Live. I'm Dr. Robbie Ludwig and today we have Dr. Wendy Walsh. She is an award-winning journalist. She is an author. She is a radio host and she recently started an amazing new podcast called Mating Matters. And <laughs> She's incredible, and she's also my dear friend and the nicest person you would ever want to meet. Wendy, thank you for joining me. Oh, thanks for all those accolades. Right back at you. <laughs> Listen, they're all true. It's so interesting because our careers are somewhat similar, only you became a journalist first, and you were an anchor for Extra, and then you decided to go the psychology route. Yeah, I was a local news anchor in L.A., and then did what I called silly journalism uh, at the national level for a while. And then when I settled down to have my babies in my thirties and I was nursing and there was nothing going on outside my doors that I hadn't seen or done, I went back to graduate school and got Such a master's a and PhD mood. in psychology, yeah. Do you like what you're doing now better? Well, I love the balance of it. So I teach at Cal State Channel Islands in the psychology department two days a week. I podcast one day a week. I do my live radio show one day a week and then everything else that fills in those other days. But I love the having doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It makes me happy. I, I agree. It's nice to have different chapters in your day. And it sounds like you and I are both able to achieve that. You have focused a lot on relationships love, attraction, from an evolutionary perspective. What got you interested in this specific area? Well, I was a smart working woman in my 20s and early 30s, and I couldn't find a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that there was one common denominator in all of my relationships, and it was me. <laughs> so um, I started reading about the science of love because I really believe that our most intimate connections are the most important thing that ever happens in our lifespan. Think about it. People work so that they can have access to more mates or higher status mates. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing that brings us the better health, mental health and physical health are close intimate relationships. Nobody lies on their deathbed and said they wish they worked more, right? They wish they'd spent more time with the people they love because we're put on the planet to reproduce and pretty much every other behavior we have is designed to increase our reproductive odds or at least odds of finding a partner who will help us feel secure. And I say the same thing to my patients when they're looking for love and they often feel badly admitting that they want a relationship because there's something out there in the ether in the United States and probably elsewhere where there's a bit of shame if someone were to admit that they want to be in a relationship. Does it make them dependent? Does it mean they're not independent? And I give all of my patients permission who are looking for love to do that and tell them it's the most important choice that they will ever make, because it really is. It impacts how you see yourself, what opportunities you have, and who you will become. You know, you used a word that was so interesting there, Robbie, and that's that word independence, because America was built on independence. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the time, independence from uh, England, right? And then it became individual independence to own your own land and have your own space. But we know, you and I know that a healthy relationship is about healthy interdependence, yes. leaning on each other's shoulders from time to time, having that emotional support. We also know that our entire neurochemistry changes when we are with someone. We get this beautiful rushes of dopamine, our cortisol levels, the stress hormone goes down. We have feelings of well being. This should be the number one goal in people's lives. I agree. Why do you think we get it so backwards? Why do you think so many people out there, I think it's mostly women, but maybe for men as well, where they get the idea this, it is important, but they shouldn't admit that it's important. Well, the message comes from capitalism and patriarchy, which is make money, 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 and you should spend most of your time doing that. 
And as women entered the workforce, so many women made the mistake of adopting a male model of everything, which isn't female freedom, right? When you adopt a male model of anything, that's not female freedom. You know, female freedom is being able to say, you know what, I'm in my reproductive years. This is biologically the time, the best time to have a family. And I'm gonna tell every mate that I have a date with that this is my goal right now at this stage in my life. That's female freedom to be able to- Yeah, connect. how do you think that would work out on a date though? If, if oh. someone- to say I'm in my reproductive years and I want to have a baby. I think it's the best thing. I mean, you don't have to say it like you and I are saying it, <laughs> but I, I believe that everybody should have a relationship life plan. Remember yeah. the old idea where you marry once at the beginning of your twenties and stay married until death do us part is a pretty new invention in our evolution of our species. The truth is because of our very long life expectancies, even the most monogamous of humans may have two or even three stints of long-term monogamy with some mate selection in between. And so I think it's perfectly acceptable to not hold it as a secret, what your relationship life plan is. And if that person, remember with the opportunity because of dating apps to meet potentially thousands and thousands of prospective mates, the goal shouldn't be getting a guy to like you or getting a woman to like you. It should be eliminating as many as you can until you find the one. You know, my boyfriend didn't like when he heard this the other night, but I said to him, you know, I had to throw away hundreds of men to be able to find you. And he goes, I don't wanna hear that. <laughs> now, your story is so interesting, Wendy, because you met your boyfriend during a pandemic. And I hear the frustrations from both women and men, how difficult it is to date during this time. Well, it makes the gentlemen and the gentle women rise to the top because it's mm. gotta be slow. You got to grow the intimacy on phone, FaceTime, Zoom. You got to meet with masks on a windy day. And so it's sort of, um, it ups the promise of it all. It makes the seduction long. It makes it feel better when it actually happens. And the first three times I met my now boyfriend, I picked literally, I live in California, very windy piers, restaurants on piers out over the ocean with the wind whipping and masks on, just taking it down to take a sip and putting it back on. And when he said goodbye to me each time, it was a fist bump. And uh, three times after that, he said, I'd like us both to get a COVID test because I'd really like to give you a hug tonight. It's so romantic. I, I do think what you're saying is true though. People really have to look at themselves and ask themselves, what do I really want right now? What really matters? And what's the best way to get it? And, you know, a lot of people, as you know, and you say on your various podcasts, you have so many interesting topics on there, including how to be a super attractor, which we'll get to, and dating apathy. Um, but a lot of people feel uncomfortable with knowing how to present themselves in a proper way. Do you have any recommendations for those singles out there since this is a Valentine's Day theme, February tends to be the month of love. What do you recommend for folks out there? Well, let's start with where you present yourself first. And it tends to be on a dating app nowadays. Yeah. We're talking about profiles here. Uh, men don't like, there's lots of research because they're all database, right? So all the, the dating app uh, release their, da their uh, data on a regular basis. Men don't like to see women with lots of makeup on. Women don't like to see any man over 40 with his shirt off in the bathroom mirror. Stop <laughs> it guys, okay? Uh, however, if you position yourself, if you're a man in a place where uh, you look a little upscale, even if uh, you know, you're know you a road worker or a plumber, you do get dressed up for your cousin's wedding. So make sure you include that photograph. Women like to see that, that you can clean up good. Uh, men on the other hand, like to see a woman wearing red and a woman smiling. They don't mm. necessarily like all those hot body shots either, unless they're looking for a short-term relationship. Remember mm. what you put in your profile tells the world if you're looking for a short-term or a long-term relationship, no moral judgment here, but be clear about what you're looking for. Yeah, it's like branding oneself. You really need to think about what image do you want to convey? And before there were all 
uh, of these scientific studies being done, sometimes your grandmother's advice made the most sense without moral judgment, but just information that can help you protect yourself. And you talk a lot about this, the importance of waiting to have sex if you want a long-term relationship. Well, our grandmother's advice is now backed up by science. So women tend to fall in love through big releases of oxytocin. Oxytocin is the hormone that even has its own nickname. It's called the cuddle hormone. The only other time in a woman's life that she emits so much oxytocin besides sex is when she's breastfeeding her baby to help create that bond. Men, on the other hand, fall in love through norepinephrine. Norepinephrine we call the love hormone. And for men, it doesn't happen through sex because they have so much testosterone. Testosterone blunts the impact of the oxytocin. But over time, they grow norepinephrine through a feeling of trust. So mm -hmm. if women fall in love through sex and men fall in love through trust, Men actually don't trust a woman who gives sex to them too easily because they assume she's giving it to everybody and it's harder for them. And the longer they get to date, if you can give them the gift of courtship, it's a gift, you guys, then they're able to grow more norepinephrine and release it into their neurochemistry and have feelings of love. When it happens too fast, they have a plunge afterwards. Their testosterone blunts the focus of oxygen and they actually have feelings of disappointment when you have sex too fast. And it makes sense because they probably think if she's that easy for me, then she's probably easy for everyone. And what does that mean? Is she desperate? She was easy to get. So many men talk about the love of the chase, right? And then the love of having someone is a slightly different experience. Of course, and we can say that about everything in life, whether it's a new car we're saving up for, wanting is a much stronger feeling than having. But the research shows that what keeps long-term committed people together are the memories of the courtship. So even mm -hmm. in the worst of times, when they've got a crying baby and it's three in the morning and it feels like their partner's not being helpful, they close their eyes and they remember, they click their little heels together and they remember, oh, remember that date we had, remember that honeymoon we had, remember our wedding, we're not going to throw it away because of this moment. And so courtship is an important bonding uh, time because it gives our brains that good cushion to fall back on when times are tough. So for those singles out there during Valentine's Day, during COVID and a pandemic, what is your top recommendation to have that special connection? Well, first of all, let's stop and remember that Valentine's Day is known as Singles Awareness Day. And ah. it's essentially a hallmark holiday that was invented by capitalism to sell roses and flowers and fine wine and dinners, right? So that's the first thing is if, if you're single, get cynical about it because you have every right to be cynical about it. Secondly, if it is about the holiday of love, research on gratitude and giving, uh, random acts of kindness, for instance, are equally as good as an antidepressant in a study population. Think of it as your day to give love to somebody, anybody. Think about five things that you can do on Valentine's Day to share your love with the world, whether it's writing a letter to a teacher who impacted you, whether it's simply calling your mother, whether it's telling your best friend that you really appreciate them, do whatever you need to do because the research shows that you're the beneficiary, that you get feel good hormones from all that giving. And just my advice would be flirt, enjoy flirting. It's fun and it's safe. And it's easy to do in person or actually via Zoom. And I once had a teacher tell me that it's impossible to feel depressed while you're flirting. And that sounded right to me. Exactly, because you know what flirting is? Flirting is pretending to be the person you wish you were, right? Which is what we all do on first dates, right? Yeah. It's like you're realizing that you are attractive at all times. <laughs> yeah, which we know. Okay, it's good to show up attractive though on your first date. But I remember one comedian saying that who you show up with at, uh, when you go on a date is like your representative. <laughs> Yeah, that's Chris Rock. Chris Rock right. says for the first six months, you're only dating a guy's representative. <laughs> so I just want to mention, and then we have a quick five 
some of the questions that my audience wanted you to answer, but I wanted to mention some of the great topics you cover on your podcast, which is so well produced, Wendy. Thank you. I mean, it's really enjoyable because you mix the science with the realities out there. So you really structure it like a fun class to listen to. Dating apathy, how to be a good quarantine partner, how to foster a connection during the pandemic when dating, the best way to plan a virtual date, and what's the best way to find success during dating during the coronavirus. So you have amazing topics out there. But most of it is evolutionary psychology. I think you're quoting some of the more recent ones that I'm doing and answering to people's needs. But okay. you know, we talk about things like the trouble with testosterone, how it impacts men in their courting. We talk about hidden eggs, why we are the only primate species that has concealed fertility. Every other primate, you can tell when they're fertile, but us, but there's a reason why we evolved to have this. And I won't give it away. You got to sit through it. We also talk yeah. about religion, for instance, the God who clubs, why every single religion in the world makes rules around dating, mating, and relating to increase their membership. So we talk about every kind of human behavior yeah. and we answer the question, why did it evolve and how is this related to human mating strategy? So let me go through the five questions and they might sound familiar because I think we, we touched on some of them, but what is the best advice for singles to meet someone now? The best advice for singles to meet someone now is to get on those dating apps, but here's the caveat. We all suffer from a paradox of choice. The more choice you have, the less likely you are to make a choice. And when you do make a choice, the, le the less you value that choice. So match with two or three people max, text with them only, and get to a phone call rather quickly. So I don't care if you have to get a Google phone line or you learn how to block people's numbers, you know, just literally put your phone number out there. If what you're trying to do is eliminate partners who are suffering from dating apathy, because there are a lot of people who use the apps who never actually get together for a real date. Mm -hmm. They're not actually looking for a relationship and they think they are, but they just, want to text all day long. So you want to yeah. get you want to get the ones who are active for you. Remember, you're only looking for one person and that one person better be energetic for you. Like a great example, when I was looking for my boyfriend through the haystack on the dating apps, the two people in the threesome that he that he was clumped with were like, uh, "So what are you doing? How's your day?" And there was a lot of not energy there. When I texted him, he was like, Wendy, with three exclamation marks, give me your phone number, let's jump on the phone. And he had this energy that came across in his text. And I was like, wow, this guy's into me, right? Yeah. And so that's what you want. You want somebody who's gonna rise to the occasion. And then think of it in terms of just eliminating, eliminating, eliminating. Don't try to get somebody to be attracted to you. Yeah. You choose who you're gonna be attracted to. I, I agree. It's really important. And that comes off as self-confidence too, when you're not always trying to prove yourself. And I think women get better at that when they enter into midlife and beyond. Yeah. You really know who much you easier are. As we get older, when we're younger, our hormones are telling us, believe it or not, unconsciously, we must find a mate, we must reproduce, we must yeah. find a and then you get enter the hookup culture because the biggest mistake women make is thinking I will be the nice fun girl I will give him sex I will never cause him problems and then he'll want to marry me because I'm just so easy and light and right. low impact no 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 he marries the bitch who says excuse me uh you're only dating me right we have rules here uh mm -hmm. and so that's the one that he commits to in the end the one who has standards yeah what does a healthy relationship look like? Oh, I love this. Well, there are so many kinds of healthy relationships. There's no one right way to have a healthy relationship. But I would say in general, it is one where both partners can give and receive care comfortably. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you get partners where one's the giver and one's the taker. And, uh, yes. and where both partners have a voice. Research shows long-term couples do best when they create something together. Now, the obvious one might be a family, but it could be a business. It could be a charity. You know couples with those house remodels that never get finished because that is their love relationship. They're constantly building their nest, right? And so if two people can have an active voice in a project or their life goals, and you always hear, Robbie, about 
communication, communication, yes. communication. And that is such a boring word that doesn't explain anything. What I, how I define good communication skills is not keeping secrets from your partner and being able to know that it's a safe place for you to be real and talk about even the most tender feelings of fear and sadness and not being ridiculed or dismissed for them. I, I believe there was a study done that said happiness is having people in your life and it could just be one or two where you could be your worst self with and they can handle it and support you. And I thought that was such a beautiful description. I have a more ugly description of that same thing, which is we save the most sadistic parts of our personalities for those we love the most. Yes, it's <laughs> and because it's safer. That's it's why. Safe. How do you know if it's really true love? Well, first of all, let's talk about what love is. Love evolved to help bond two people long enough to procreate and keep kids long enough until they're up and getting out of the nest. Now, in our anthropological past, kids were up and procreating by about the age of 12, because you didn't need to know a lot to survive, how to make mm -hmm. a fire, which berries were poison, and you could figure that out by the time you were 12. And you also had a very big village of people helping you raise the next generation. So love evolved as a bonding tool. How do you know if it's true love? It's true love, in my opinion, if you can be yourself. You know, my yeah. favorite definition of intimacy is being able to see the flaws in your partner and still love them. Mm -hmm. More importantly, knowing that they can see the flaws in you yes. and you still loving yourself. Yes, that's beautiful. And then our final question, because I know that you have somewhere to go what makes somebody a super attractor? Because who doesn't want to be a super attractor? Well, actually, I think the episode you're talking about is the secret life of super attachers. Oh, and these I are... made it super attractor. I got <laughs> another podcast to do. And basically, I interviewed very long-term married couples who still claim to be happy and still claim to be having regular sex because I was so curious to know yeah. who are these weird people? How is this possible after 25, 30 years to still be knocking boots and having a great old time? Mm -hmm. And uh, we interviewed a, a geneticist who talks about the gene for monogamy and different genetic uh, attractors that help keep people together. We also talk about a secure attachment style. So people who have a secure attachment style, as I mentioned, are those who can give and receive love comfortably. They're also people who, um, it, you know, don't have anxiety around whether their partner's going to leave them all the time. Yeah. They also can tolerate intimacy. They're not avoidant and, and dismissive and running away from feelings. Uh, but but it, 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 I want everyone to know that attachment style can change and you can learn healthy attachment because it's a skill. And as you learn anything, whether it's a new golf swing or a new Pilates position, the more you do it consciously, the more it becomes unconsciously automatic. So there are lots of ways to learn how to have a healthy relationship. I agree, I agree. And also just simplistically look at people you admire and ask them questions because they'll most likely tell you Dr. Wendy Walsh, so thrilled to have you. And thank you for sharing your immense knowledge about this topic. Where can people find your radio show and your podcast? Always a treat to see you, Dr. Robbie. I want to be in a makeup chair beside you again. That's where we met at CNN New York. I know. <laughs> the best place to meet friends, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, so you can follow me anywhere on my social media. The handle is at Dr. Wendy Walsh. I have a new TikTok channel that is just blowing up. It's hysterical. I cannot believe the party going on over there at TikTok. Uh, but also I have a radio show on iHeartRadio called The Dr. Wendy Walsh Show that you can listen to at any time on the iHeartRadio app. And my podcast, Mating Matters, you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Really easy to find. And we're also going to have links. And I just want to mention too, Wendy, you have great books. 30 have the Boyfriend Test, The Girlfriend Test, and The 30 Day Love Detox. Yes. Uh, and now I think the world is less about books and it's more about 
quick videos and podcasts. That's where people are obtaining their information. But you're very knowledgeable about all of the above. And just thank you again. And have a happy Valentine's Day. I look forward to meeting your new beau. Yes, we'll have to get together sometime when this is over. (laughs) Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. I'm counting down the days. And thank you to our audience for coming and joining us during this holiday special.